I'm here to introduce the mixing desk, um, but before we do that, uh, don't panic. Um, there's twelve. There are twelve faders in the in the mixing desk. It's a lot of information. I will go through them very quickly. You will get all of them in a more detailed way later in the week and later today. You already gotten a lot of information and. Uh, it's an exciting place and we're all excited that you are here and that we are here, so uh, don't panic. It will all turn out in the end. It has the previous years and I'm very sure that you will also understand everything in the end. But let's talk lab design. The first thing when you realize when you're doing lab design is that you are in control of everything. And by everything, I actually mean everything. Everything in the lab you will design has a surface, abstract or physical, and that is designable. So for example, you decide the duration of the thing, or you decide where it is, how people will interact, which character they're gonna have, and so on and so forth. So everything is in your control. Um, and every time you answer a question or decide something, new questions will arise. And does not, this does not matter if you go to the laboratory and have 48 hours, where you definitely would use up all the time, or like some of the labs I've made that took a year and a half, pretty concentrated work. Every time new questions arose and we used all the time there was, and at some point you cannot there's no more time and then the players come and then you have to stop designing. <laughs> or sometimes you continue designing during the thing. So it's a lot of work, but it's brilliant and fun. And of course, everything has consequences. If you, for example, design, decide to do a lab in this room and you place the toilet two kilometers away, then a lot of the, most of the time, most of the players will not be at your location. Everything has consequences. Even decisions that you do not make because you're not aware of it will have consequences on your lab. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. If we take the family Anderson, you had, of course, a fiction. The parents were dead. There was a will. Uh, you need to figure that out, and there was a lawyer and so on. You had some game tools. There was a clock that decided for how long you could interact. You had some characters that you shared, and then when you all decided that that was the actual reality you would use in that hour, and stepped into that magic circle, that created the lab. So, Lab design is often about questions, where to begin. Often, as some of the previous speakers said, you start with an idea or maybe you have a location uh, that you really want to use and then you design for that and so on. And then the first question you get is what, what questions to, what, what question do you need to ask yourself and your fellow designers to get to where you want to go? And what are your options? And this is what we are going to teach you here, is many of those options. I remember when I started designing, I realized very quickly that I was from a specific design tradition where we did stuff in one particular way that we thought was the best way. And then I met people from, say, Sweden, Norway, Finland and other places and realized that they designed games very differently. And it's not that their way was better or worse, it's just a different way of doing it. And you can learn a lot by talking to people from different gaming cultures or LARPing cultures on how they do it. And that would give you new possibilities, new questions to ask and new answers you can give. And of course, what consequences are there when you make these decisions? And that is what we're gonna go through at the Fader Talks. We're gonna describe what consequences there are if you choose to place the Fader in a specific point. But what is the mixing desk. This is of course a mixing desk. It is what used by it is used by sound technicians to uh, mix a soundscape or a movie or whatnot. So you move the faders up and down so you get the exact 
soundscape that you are aiming for. And you can change it over time to get different aspects. And the mixing desk of Lab is a little bit like that. So you have uh, faders and each fader in each end of the fader there's a specific design ideal. It could be openness, closeness, how transparent is a game, a lab. Uh, and there's 11 others that we'll go through. And the ones that we have chosen for the curriculum here at the summer school matches the labs that you're going to play and the stuff that we're going to teach. There are many more uh, faders than this, and you can invent your own as well. As you can see out in the end, it says your fader here. Probably that's something that we have not thought about that you will think about. Please tell us. We'll be looking forward to the discussions. Um, so the mixing desk, what we are using it for and what it can be used for is it's a help to make conscious choices about the design. So by looking at the faders, it will immediately ask, uh, bring up questions that you have. If I make this choice, what will happen? If I make this choice, what will happen? So it's the tool to ask all those bright questions that you need to ask. And is, it is very difficult to realize that yourself. It takes a long time. So this is a brilliant tool to help you get to where you want to go. And it's a set of ideas to explore. So if you go, if you take a lab you already made or a lab that you want to make or one you have played, you, if you say, okay, if I change this specific fader, what will happen with the design then? And as we're, we're using it here as a tool to design. What it is not, it is not a complete tool a model of lab, of lab design. This is an ongoing process and uh, the, the faders that we presented three years ago are not the same that we're presenting now. The wording that you got in your folders is not necessarily the wording that you'll hear from the stage because we continue to evolve this and we discuss it and, and debate it and it is wonderful. And if you have any questions to it, please just talk to the people who lecture or facilitate and we love to discuss and debate this. Another thing is that it's not translatable into numbers. You cannot compare two designs and say, let's take the transparency fader and say, uh, this one has twice the amount of that, or this is a seven. Uh, that does not make any sense. It, it only makes sense within the, the individual design, and you can say, I can turn it up, or you can turn it down. Uh, bring more or less of the thing into it. So you, you cannot compare stuff to it. It's not a model where you can give, care, give uh, any grades. Let's say this is a seven or eight. The mixing disc uh, consists of faders. And each fader, as I said, covers a specific design choice. And the, ends is, the end of each fader is a design ideal. Often when you go to the end of the fader, if you go all the way to max, all the way to minimum, the fader will sort of break down and it would not make sense anymore. And that sort of corresponds to the thing that you cannot set, put numbers on it because it sort of goes to infinity. And if you bring a design ideal to infinity, then stuff starts, weird stuff starts to happen. I'll give some examples later. And one of the, if you have a one fader in one position, that does not exclude faders to be in a specific position in the other end. They affect each other. So if you move one, then maybe the other ones will move as well. You could take, if you say again about transparency and how much you tell about the stuff, and then you decide to write all the characters yourself, then the transparency might drop a little bit. And during a lab, a fader can start with uh, being in one position, and by the middle or the end of the lab, it can change to something else. They're not static, and if you look at design in one end of the lab, maybe it's in one position, and in another end, it's in an, a, a different position. So when the fader goes to max, that is where the top aspect of the fader is dominant, of course, and at the bottom, it's the bottom fader that is dominant, and in the middle, they are equally present. And it's quite important to say that just because it's the bottom one does not mean that it is less important than the top one. They could be swapped around. Does that make sense? Cool. 
We have 12 faders, as I said, and uh, I'll go through them very quickly. Uh, again, don't uh, panic. Uh, some of them are quite complicated, some of them are quite easily understood. Uh, they are in the folder as well, so you can read them there. And of course, we'll go through them here and you can always ask us questions. The first fader communication style, verbal versus physical. I will explain that right after this into a fader talk, so I'll wait with that one. You'll get more information about that later. Then there's the player motivation. Is it, com is it competitive or is it collaborative? Competition versus collaboration. So in one end, for example, if you played Family Anderson said, the one who gets the most inheritance wins the, the lab. Then the lab completely changes. Or if you played in the other end of the scale to say, we want the most dramatic story or the most the story where everybody leaves the room crying, then it's not about who does the best, but it's about what the group does together. Then we have a fader called bleed in. Bleed in is a LARP expression that does not make any sense if we, if outside of the LARP community. It means that you play a character that is very close to yourself. So in one end you have differentiation, which means that you play a character that is far from yourself. For example, in Family Anderson, where you played a character uh, that could be extremely far from you. And in the other end, playing close to home. For example, if Oliver played Oscar, the Copenhagen architect, uh, and that is the only thing we change is his name, then it's a character that is very close to home, so very close to where Oliver is in his daily life. Then we have character creation responsibility. At Family Anderson you got characters, uh, so that would be pretty high up on the organizer part of the fader. But if you, for example, in, the, in, the, in Family Anderson was told that now you go and create your own character, then it would of course be your responsibility and it would be in the other end. The same goes for culture creation responsibility. Is this something you, as a designer, uh, chooses everything in the culture of the thing? Or is it something that you workshop and facilitate together with your, your players? Again, that is a conscious choice you need to make. Then there's the openness fader. It's about how much information do you give to your participants or your players. In one end, of course, if you have a lot of transparency, everybody knows everything and it's way easier to sort of start conflicts if you know that the other person has this background and so on. If you have a lot of secrecy, you have the possibility for your players to experience that, uh, that somebody has lied to them or so, and so on. You, it's very difficult if there's a lot of transparency to have, have lying as a, a, a way in the game because everybody knows everything. Then we have player pressure. And this is, goes from hardcore to pretense. And at Family Anderson, it wasn't a very there wasn't a lot of player pressure. Most of you, uh, I've heard, was sitting down around the table playing. Is that correct? So there was very little player pressure. So it could be that a fight broke out during the, the, the game and actually fisting each other in the face. Uh, then, of course, the, it would be more hardcore, as, as it's called. Game master style, active versus passive. Many uh, organize, many designers or organizers choose that when the game starts they do not interfere at all with the thing, then it just goes on until it's over. In other, uh, in other games or labs, it's the, the, or the game designer can be extremely active and say, could you stop? We're going to rewind five minutes and then we're going to play the scene again. And the, you can choose to do that as many times as you want. Then you are very active, have a very active game master style. So. Then we have game mechanics. Those are the tools that we use inside the game that does not, is not part of the fiction, but is something that will drive the game forward. It could be like the timers in, in Family Anderson. That is a game mechanic to make sure that everybody uh, is encouraged to talk. And also it's, it's very conveniently make sure that the game never goes over time. So that's a game mechanic, and, and you can choose it to be very 
intrusive so that for example if the if the organizer get, uses the rewind thing I explained before, that's very intrusive because you step in, you stop the story, and you change it. Or it can be very discreet. The clock, the timer is pretty discreet. Or it could be um, that if somebody wears red, that means a specific thing within the fiction. That's also a game mechanic. And that is extremely discreet. Then we have the environment. And Jakob will talk about that later in the week. And it go in the one end, we have the 360 degree illusion. And that very shortly means that everything you see is, is actually the way it is. And in the other way, end, we have symbolism where every, everything not is the way it is. So if we, for example, had to play a lab in this room where we put the fader close to max in the 360 illusion, we would play a lab in this room at Ruta uh, during the summer school. Or if we put it in the symbolism end, it could be we are in deep space, we are all weightless, have spacesuits on, and are shooting lasers. And none of that is present here, of course. And ev not even gravity would be present. So then it's, it's way more in the other end of the, the scale. Representation of theme. This is one of the more uh, theoretical and heavy uh, faders. Uh, it goes about. It goes from one end where you design for stories. So, for example, the Family Anderson game is a very much story-driven game. You have your characters and you try to achieve a specific goal and so on and so forth. And you do that by creating story together. In the other end, we have designing for actions, and that is when you design that specific physical actions will do would make sure that other specific action will will happen it's a it's a bit abstract but it'll make sense when uh, tova has gone through the fader later th in the week and the final and 12th is loyalty to world it goes from playability to plausibility uh, and this is especially for example if you do a historic game you would uh, have to make de decisions between the plausibility of the game. For example, if you play, um, if you play, uh, I think in the FOLA it says that if you play, let's say in the 1920s, and the the manager of a big big factory uh, could probably not be a woman, because that's the way it, it was in the early 20s. Uh, you can of course change that to make the game more playable and enjoyable for the female players, so they also have the possibility to be the manager of the factory. So you have to choose between how playable it is and how plausible it is. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you. So the important questions to ask when you design is of course, what do you want to achieve? What is the theme that you are aiming for? Uh, what faders are locked? Sometimes uh, some faders you don't have access to because of, let's say, budget. So if you have, let's say, 10 euros to do uh, a lab, then it's very difficult to do the uh, zero gravity space battle game, uh, simply because you cannot afford it. Um, so th many things can be locked. So if the only room we have available for the lab is this room, that also locks a lot of the parameters of how, what you can design. And of course, uh, a question you should ask is also what faders are missing to achieve what I want to achieve doing this lab? What, what in the design do we need to take care of to make sure that we get to, to where we want to? And that was the uh, introduction of the mixing desk.